everybody. Welcome to Get the Point. I'm Dave Fleming. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm thrilled you're here. And boy, do I have an awesome guest for you this week. I've got a U.S. National Collegiate Champion at Division I from UCLA and one of the best pickleball players on the women's tour. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andrea Coop. Andrea, how are you? Hey, Dave. Thanks for having me tonight. I'm, I'm good. Uh, I'm excited to play Del Rey next week. Uh, I had a little ankle injury in February, but I'm really looking forward to getting back out on the court and going somewhere warm because it's been cold in Michigan. Yes, well, we're excited to see you compete. I'm glad you're healthy. And I'm also glad for our viewers that we're going to get inside that mind of yours that's had an enormous amount of success, not just in tennis, but obviously on the pickleball court as well. And we will do that right after these messages from our sponsors. As I mentioned, we're with Andrea Coop, and we're going to look at two gold medal matches. Yes, this guest is always in the mix at the end. And the first one we're going to look at here is the APP Cincinnati Open. Andrea is on the far side of the court in the white tank top, and her partner, Callie Smith, is about to serve. Callie will be serving to Michelle Esquivel in the white visor you see in the lower right corner. And straight across from Andrea is Maggie Raminzi Chow. That's Andrea's sister. Yes. So as we go through, we're going to just look at a pretty straightforward point here, Andrea. But we'd love to hear from you. What is it like to play against your sister? And more importantly, in a gold medal match. Tell us what that's all about. Uh, honestly, it's a lot of pressure to play against my sister, but uh, we both try to keep it uh, in the family and either way, someone in the family is going to win. So we, we try to keep that perspective that uh, some a Romenzi girl is bringing home gold, uh, especially in this match, no matter what. I'm going to play the next two shots. Uh, both sides had the same problem, and I'd love to hear you diagnose what you think happened here. So we'll start with uh, your team, obviously returning on the far side. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was me. I should have been over into the middle a little bit more to help Callie out. Uh, Callie really set up that point really well. Um, Michelle had a great return down the line. And Callie ne really neutralized it with a great drop, came up to attack and yeah, then I attacked and I should have moved over to close that middle because um, Maggie, Maggie had a great dig, but um, she would have had to hit an unbelievable shot to pass me up down the line for a winner on a shot like that. Whereas if I would have taken one step over to the right, or I guess that would have been my left in that point, it probably would have been a pretty easy duck, if you will. Yeah. I, I think Callie's the same. She, just like I should have moved to my left, she should have been more over and to her right. So we're both closing the middle because it's, it's easy for a team to, or somebody to play D and get to the middle. It's really hard to hit any shot close to the line. And if we would have closed the middle there, either of us could have hit it. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'd love your opinion on this. We talked uh, a little bit the, about this on my last show with, with Jocelyn. 
the tennis mentality of, man, this is a put away. I mean, you hammer this ball you're about to hit right here is hammered. That is a winner a hundred out of a hundred times in tennis. It's hammered at your sister and she does make an unbelievable play. And I certainly have had to get this mentality and Jocelyn and I talked about this last week and pickleball, the ball's always coming back and she hit an unbelievable shot. Is that something you've been working on as well? I know other tennis players I talk to deal with that as well, or was this just one of those times where you got caught a little bit on the, on the sideline there? I probably got caught, but you know, pickleball, it does always come back and you're right in tennis, the, the court's bigger. Uh, and you, you don't hit in doubles in tennis. You're not necessarily like I, I hit it right at Maggie's feet there. That's not really a, a shot and comparable. You don't do that in doubles. You have a lot in tennis, you have a lot more court to hit into. So it's not coming back most of the time. Whereas here in pickleball, the court's smaller. And a lot of times the best put away shot is right at the other person, not because there's just no court to hit into. And that's what I did there. And Maggie picked it up great. Um, but Callie and I, neither Callie or I closed the middle in that point. And I think we both just got caught. Yeah. And I think, uh, if I'm you, I would take the ball you hit a hundred out of a hundred times. I was very un, unexpected loss of a point. And as you can see on the scoreboard, very early in the match, interestingly enough, later in the match, the reverse happened. So, uh, again, I think what, what's interesting here is we have four really high level players. Um, and the middle of the court is a factor. You know, I think, I, I don't know for sure about Maggie and Michelle at this point, but I know that this was the first time that Callie and I had ever played together and we haven't played together since. We are playing uh, one time this year, but we struggled with the middle as a team all day in Cincinnati. We just never really got comfortable. And that's, I mean, I would say, cause we'd never played together before. Yeah. And I, playing and gelling as a partnership is really important. Um, and I don't know that Maggie and Michelle had ever played before this either, or if they had, it had only been one time, but it is important. You know, we, there are rules in pickleball. If someone's cross court, then the person cross court has the middle, but you know, rules go out the door as well during a point. And sometimes you just know, oh, my partner, I played with her, she's got this. And, you don't get that without playing a lot of matches together. So that's an incredible point that you made there. Obviously, these are balls that a team that is used to playing together, just it's, it's second nature. That mm -hmm. middle ball is on the left, or in some cases, maybe they want somebody's big two in it backhand taking that, but it's all been vetted out. You know mm -hmm. what's happening because even on this one, that, even the first little dink in the middle, you guys were a little hesitant where you normally probably wouldn't be like that ball right there. It's just, right. okay, uh, we're still okay with it. So I think, you know, the message to our viewers on this is it's awesome to be able to practice and play with the same people over and over again. And you will have escalating results because you will be used to what you can and cannot do. And that doesn't just mean court coverage. That means the types of shots people hit, you get used to, oh, I know they do this with their backhand, their forehand, etc. And it's also a good thing to know if you are a tournament player viewer, that if you know the people on the other side are a new partnership, you know that either because someone told you that, or you can just tell they're unfamiliar. Throwing that ball in the middle is a great idea because they've got to work it out. That's not your problem. And as you can see here at the highest level, it still creates some problems. So uh, those little nuances are the things that win and lose tournaments. They win and lose points. And it's just something to think about as you take a new partner, you really need to try and figure that out. Any other tips for people with a, you know, getting a new partner, anything you would suggest, Andrea, to tell them, hey, I think you should do something. You talked about the cross court, that somebody should cover the rules. What are a couple of those rules that uh, you sort of live by in a new partner? 
partnership? Sure. So, well, if we watch this point here, you, right where you've got it paused right now, look at Callie move over to the left because Michelle just hit that ball. Callie moved over to her left to cover the middle because Michelle was cross court from her. And the person, now again, Callie's in the middle because Michelle hit the ball. Now she should move over a little bit to her right because Maggie's in front of her and hitting. Again, she moved to the middle because Michelle hit it. Maggie's in front, so she takes a step to the left. And I moved to the middle because Maggie was hitting it. So the, per the person who's cross court from the person hitting the ball generally should take the, should take the middle, should cover the middle. Um, in tennis, my, my tennis coach, Stella Sampras, said that you, we, in doubles, you can split the court up into six sections. And if they can hit like section one and basically a cross court angle winner, you just give it to them and say, nice shot. You can kind of think about that in pickleball too. If they hit a sweet cross court winner, just say nice shot, but you can have 85% of the court covered if both people are following that whoever's cross court rule rule to live by. Now, if you're a team that's always playing together and you, you don't want to do it that way, for instance, like who we're going to see in a second, Sarah and Regina, they've played a lot of matches together and Sarah covers the middle for that team most of the time no matter where the ball is coming from. And she's great at it. And that there's nothing wrong with doing that if you're a partnership that's comfortable. But if you've never played together, those cross court, person cross court covering the middle can cut down on a lot of those um, partner communication issues. So great. So thrilled you went there. And basically just to lay this out for everybody that's watching, Andrew is basically saying, don't get beat to your inside shoulder, get beat to your outside sh shoulder. Meaning in this case, Andrea's left shoulder, like if they roll something crazy, if her sister rolls something crazy cross court, just inside the line, that's the shot that Andrea has given up and they can live with that. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have like this ball right here that ends up beating uh, Michelle and Maggie not quite having that figured out, but I'd much rather get beat over my outside shoulder every time. And I think you guys take that one piece of advice to your next practice and see how much better you are at covering the middle. Great mm -hmm. stuff, Andrea. We will be right back, as Andrea mentioned, with a new match, new opponents, and a new partner for Andrea after these words from our sponsor. We are back on Get the Point with my sensational guest, Andrea Coop, and we have moved now to the APP Hilton Head Open. Again, Andrea is in the gold medal match, and she is partnered with Corinne Carr. She's in the purple. In the near court, you've got a couple of head players. So you've got Sarah Ansbury, who's up at the no volley zone, and Regina Franco is returning in the far section of the court three different backhands here. So if you can talk about why you did what you did with each of these and help our viewer understand why you made the choices you made. I think everyone has a lot that they could learn from your backhand. So Sarah's serving to Corinne here. So let's go through each one of those. Sure. Let's let's look at this. There's a mentality that you should always take the ball out of the air. Yep. I There's don't know if I necessarily agree with that because in this case you chose not to. Why and what did you do because of it? So I chose not to here because and I I I think Sarah wanted me to take it out of the air. If I would have taken that out of the air, I would have been hitting her. She had a we would call it a roll drop. I would have hit that out of the air at my ankles. I would not have started that point on offense at all. 
by taking a step back and because she rolled it so much, it actually bounced pretty high. We see where I hit it. I'm hitting that ball above the net. So I really could start off taking a pretty good crack at it. And Sarah, she had a pretty good pickup there, but she went from being in a, hitting a pretty aggressive role to now all of a sudden hitting a being on defense on the fifth ball there because I stepped back and attacked her third. So already a great decision has been made. And folks, this is an important thing. As you play at higher levels, people like to do exactly what Andrea said, which is roll their third. Rolling meaning there's topspin. And the ball does, if it's thrown too high, jumps up. And it ultimately is higher than the net, as Andrea said here. It would have hit you at your ankles if you stayed at the kitchen line and you might have had to pop the ball up. And that is exactly what you can see Sarah waiting for. So Sarah does do a nice little half volley in the transition zone here. And then you hit this shot uh, a lot, which is this sort of one-handed punch backhand volley. It's not a two-hander. Why do you use one versus two hands on a, on a ball like this one? Um, well, it's probably for the same reason. Uh, the one-hander, I have more reach. And if I wanted to go with two, I'd be hitting it again too low off the ground because my reach, my reach isn't as far with two hands. So I, I need the ball to be higher. I, I always want to hit it with two hands if the ball's high enough. But if it's not, that's my, my second option. And it's, it's, it was still high enough that I would call this, a, I would call this like a, it's not a neutral ball, but it's also not a, we're definitely winning the point. It's a ball we're setting up to hopefully win the point one or two shots later. So, so much to unpack from that sentence. And I love every word in that sentence. So as you can see here, as the ball is traveling, Andrea actually does have both hands on the paddle here, but she has, as she just said, is judging the height of the ball. And if she does give up the reach of that second hand, the ball's gonna be lower and she's not gonna do something more aggressive. We heard her say a minute ago, they wanted their team to be more aggressive in this match. So what is she doing instead? Taking a hand off of there and pushing that ball back and folks, she said, and this happens all the time, and you will become a better player when you think this way, to try and win this point one or two shots from now. That's what we're talking about here. So let's see what happens from there. So then we get all the fury coming on the last one. So you get that ball with the one-hander, turn it on the other side of Sarah too. I love when you make somebody defend on both sides of their body. She got the half volley in the forehand, she's over on the backhand, trying to do something with that. Corinne hits a great ball and now, I mean, you're already ready, full on rotation, bang. Yeah, I tried to go right at Sarah's feet because we talked about it earlier. She is in no man's land. Again, tennis phrase, I don't, however you want to call it. That is not a good spot to be in at that point. There, they, at least both her and Regina are there. And they're, again, two of the best players at being there. They're more comfortable than most people are being in the middle of the court like that. But, but um, after Corinne hit her forehand ball, or maybe as Corinne was hitting her forehand ball because by that point, Sarah had hit two or three balls that bounced high in the kitchen or she didn't get down into the kitchen. You maybe wanna move back to the baseline and give yourself another opportunity to reset it. But staying there gave me a target and I went right at her feet because she, she stayed there for me. Uh, in pickleball, like we talked about earlier, the person generally is your target because the court is so small. And if we would have hit it high in her body, she would have been able to block it anywhere from her waist down with her hands, but it's much harder to defend at your feet. No doubt. When we can hit down in this sport, 
defending off your ankles is the hardest thing to do here. And that ball was spanked too. So, uh, um, so we saw the progression, not taking a ball out of the air on the backhand, step back, start the point on the offensive, one hand because you didn't have the reach and then two hands to finish it off. So for those of you thinking about, am I a two-handed player? Am I not? Andrea showed you the way to be both. And I think uh, a lot of people do that. Uh, tennis players, if you've always done it, try it. And if you've never hit a two-handed backhand, again, go out when you play rack. That's the time to work on your game. Try it and see the difference in reach that one hand versus two does and where the height of the ball is when you can attack. So Andrea, great stuff there from someone who loves to hit a two-handed backhand hard myself. I love to see it in action, certainly off of your paddle, that's for sure. Let's end this show with just another BB off your backhand. Uh, here we go. You can just sort of watch this, this point. You're up 3-0 in the game to 15, and uh, you said you wanted to be aggressive. Well, here you go. Right at the beginning, you can see it's ideal. We got up to the line with two balls, a third and Corinne's fifth. And against a team like that, getting up as fast as possible is, is what you want if you're trying to be on offense. When you're hanging out back there at the baseline or even in the middle of the court, you're not gonna get the advantage. And you can see us here, we're really trying to move our dinks around. That's what we did. We moved the, the way we got that point or got the advantage is by hitting, you know, the dink went to basically played figure eight with our dink. So we drew a figure eight or drew a drew the star on the on the pickleball court. And that's why we got that pop up. And that's what I talked about earlier, trying to be aggressive with our dinks, even though, you know, we're not we're not gonna win a point with a dink. And you always think that a dink is just an opportunity to not mess up, but at this level, you can be aggressive with a dink and you're, you're doing it with a purpose besides not, not mess up. So people love to sell the dink with a purpose shirts and dink with a purpose is a great motto. Now you said something there that I loved and I'd love for you to describe it in a little more detail for our viewers. You said, look at us dink in a figure eight or a star. What did you mean by that? Sure. Um, so what I mean by that is when you changing up. So I think, yeah, Corinne starts it down the line there and then Regina or Sarah went cross and I went down the line here and Regina went back down the line and now I went cross. So we're making every other ball essentially. We're not just thinking to Regina. We're not just thinking to Sarah. We're moving the ball around. Sarah hit two in a row there, three in a row and she brought it to me and now I move it down the line to Regina. And that's where Corinne is, that's where we got that high ball that Corinne started and then Regina popped it to me and I ended it. And we got that ball just because we moved our dinks around. Sometimes, you know, it's great to hit unattackable dinks and get into that cross court rally, but you know, somebody as good at dinking as Sarah Ansbury is not just gonna mess it up. You've, you're even hit it up high. You've got to make her move or, move her around or change up the direction of the ball because these players are all too good to just pop it up for no reason. That doesn't happen at our level. Well, let me tell you that two-handed backhand winner was a beaut after the figure eight, folks. We've got ice skating involved in uh, today from our friend from Michigan. So didn't that work out beautifully? I'll tell you what, this has been fantastic, Andrea. Your insights into the way you play the game, the way you see it, I know will be appreciated by all of our viewers. Thank you so very much for being on the show today. Really, really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. My pleasure indeed. And folks, thank you for joining us. If you want to get all of the APP TV news, information, and when new shows come out, please subscribe on the APP TV YouTube channel. We've got a lot of great shows, not just this one, Get the Point, but we've got shows from Lauren McLaughlin, 
a tips and coaching show from Dom Catalano and Adam Stone and Corinne Carr, who you saw right here, have a cooking show. So please subscribe. Thanks again for joining us. Hope to see you again next time. And until then, peace. Thank you.